Welcome to the Roman Atwood Podcast. We're sitting here with Country, my beautiful wife, Brittany, and Yusuf Erica, Aww. a.k.a. Fusi, a.k.a. Dosa Fusi, a.k.a. <laughs> Yusuf? You could put anything in the world and it'll fit. It'll Literally. fit. How many channels do you have now? Um, I've had about 17. Um, <laughs> going on 17 now. Your recommendation today about just keep making new ones every time I have a new video might be my new plan. Just so maybe 365 by the end of this year. It's not a new video. It's a new channel every week. Yeah. A brand new show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, man. Welcome to Ohio. Welcome to the podcast. You are definitely in the top requested Yes. influencers to be here yes yeah well thank you beautiful when roman told me that it made me really happy so yeah, we that's have actually we have, we have such a large past we've done a lot together um i don't even know where to start with this with this podcast mm -hmm. because we have a history we all have history we've all been together through many years of fun and you know what's so interesting about that like you said we haven't seen each other in what five years i believe because like i said like I don't think Cora was in the picture last time we hung out. Well, she's right? about to be five. I wasn't pregnant, so it'd be longer than five. Longer than five. But I say that to say, when you picked me up at the airport yesterday, and literally, I was like, I, was, I remember tense doing something. Right when I heard your voice, and I looked at you, and I said, you're like a ray of sunshine. It felt like a day hadn't passed. It was just and there. for the other reason, you guys don't age. Like, Stop. I don't know. You don't. Stop. You don't. Don't, don't zoom in. Don't zoom in. You, do, do they age? I mean, you look exactly the same, too, since the last time. Like, you guys don't age. It's something in Ohio. I appreciate that. You, you, what are you talking about, bro? Well, I age you backwards. You better than all yeah. of us. I age backwards. That's the thing that I do. Because I like, I used to gain weight and lose weight. And whenever I lose weight, I age backwards. Your body changes a lot. Yeah. Like, I don't know which fussy I'm getting every five years. But do you remember the first time we saw Fusi? No. The first time ever VidCon? Close on or close off? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm trying do to wait. Remember? I don't even remember this. What, no. what, you're going to spark the memory. We were at VidCon. You had like this huge jacket on because you were like so self conscious. Yeah. You were just so mad at your like body. Really? I do not remember this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Because I was only been at well, VidCon I guess like. That's the time I met you. I don't know if maybe I you think met him so. First. I think so. I think that was my yeah. I, I know which VidCon that was. But still, but I, what I want to say about that is because whenever I transform my body, everyone always says, you know, because people they don't keep up to date. So if I post a TikTok, they probably haven't seen me for five years. Mm -hmm. They go, "Bro's done this seven times. Bro's <laughs> done this eight times." <laughs> I vow to make this the final time. You're going to roll with this. I'm going to roll with this. This, and I'm sure we'll get into it for this podcast. This is now a fundamental lifestyle mm. as opposed to let me just fix my outside and hope somehow my life gets better and I become a happier person, which I've tried time and time again. So this version that you see of me, this is it. He He's started here to from stay. the inside I will say, out. I will say this. Yeah. Uh, you look your absolute best that I've ever seen you. Thank you. Your teeth are whiter than ever. <laughs> You're happy. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I can, I can, I can vouch and say I hope that this is you. Thank this, you, man. You, you look awesome, man. Thank I'm you. Pumped. And that, that's all I can ask for. Like when people say, like, "Oh, you've done this so many times," it's like, "Well, just put your blessings in that it stays this time." Because obviously, as a person, you don't want to revert. You don't want to be this version of you, then all of a sudden go back to unhappy and everything. And I do want to get into that and talk about that later on, because there are moments where like, it's so easy to slip and fall off the wagon and fall back to your vices and fall back to addiction and stuff. But it's that constant work that you got to do day in and out to remain here. Do you know where the turning point was for this final? Why not an eighth time? Why not binge on the Twinkies for the next two months? and go to the eighth time what's the what's the difference between six and seven and if you want me to get right into that i could answer that yeah. um it's interesting because there have been so many times in my life that you would think that it would have been my wake-up call like there was an incident that i don't talk about anymore because it's so far removed from my past where i had a very public manic outfall that the whole world saw yeah i didn't see it <laughs> i know he did because he was on top of the car with me but a year after that what a lot of people don't know even though that was the single-handedly worst thing that could have ever happened in my life and it should have been the turning point i went back to the same substance that i used during that time adderall 
And that's the thing that ruined my life. Mm. It wasn't a wake up call yet. There was an incident that happened last year where I showed up to a reality show. I'm not going to retell the whole story because yeah, yeah. it's just, it's not worth it anymore. It's like we, we spend so much time talking about our past. We should be talking about the present. But I showed up to a reality show, blacked out drunk, on Adderall at 32 years old and on clonazepam, which is in the same family as Xanax. And I get knocked out by the most popular social media kid out there, Bryce Hall. So in comparison, getting knocked out by Bryce Hall, a public manic episode that the whole world saw, what's worse, the public episode, lost all my money, lost everything, nobody wanted anything to do with me, but it was the Bryce Hall incident that woke me up. And I say that to say- I actually put you to sleep. <laughs> You're so annoying. <laughs> I say that to say when I was on the phone, I went to rehab and I'm sure we'll talk about that. I was on the phone with my brother and my brother goes, when I'm telling him about all these changes that are happening, he goes, Yusuf, we spent years trying to tell you all this. I go, and you could have spent the next 10 years until I was ready to make that change and commitment. Nothing was going to change me. So for whatever reason at 30, I was 31 when it happened, 31 years old. It was just enough. I woke up the next morning. I don't know where I am. I'm on the sofa. My jaw hurts. My back of my head hurts. I walk to the bathroom and I'm like, what happened last night? No recollection. Look at the producers. Where's my bed? They go, you got knocked out last night. We got in a physical altercation. We're sending you home. That moment was just enough. I was unhappy. I was tired. I was tired. I was tired of being that person i was tired of not changing i literally looked at myself in the mirror and said bro when is enough going to be enough like you keep living the same sob story this victim mentality you know you're not changing i created this narration in my head of you're you you have depression you have ocd you're bipolar all this stuff i was like when is enough enough i can have everything and that could be true but if i don't do anything about it it's never going to change so well, if anybody can, can bounce back from zero, it's you. You've done this time and time again, whether it's YouTube, um, fitness. You have this way of disappearing, coming back, and then taking over. It's crazy. It's wild. So for, for listeners, there's a lot of people listening right now that's struggling with the same exact thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we always, we've, we've learned this growing up. It's like you have to learn the hard way. Some people have to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. You think you're the hard way guy? You had to learn the hard way? You weren't going to make that change without it? 100%. How, how do we get people to not learn the hard way? Because like you said, you have to be all in personally to make that final change. Yeah. You can't tell anybody. So you can preach all day. And you can show them the way even, but it doesn't mean they're going to implement it. You had a self-humbling over and over and over. It, it comes like a lot of people ask me the question of like, hey, how do I get my mindset right to lose weight? And I tell them, I literally say, and I say like the way I motivate, because I do still in my life, I've always wanted to be a motivational speaker. And I think everything I do in life is leading me to that point. I say, I, I'm kind of harsh with it, but I say, look at yourself in the mirror. Aren't you tired? Like, I was like, your mom's not going to come in and save you. Your mom's cooking isn't because a lot of the stuff your mom's cooking is actually, to, you know, she wants to see you fat and happy. And, you know, that's that's her way of loving. Your mom's not going to save you. Your therapist isn't going to save you. The pills that Big Pharma is giving you, which I have a huge thing with in my head, is not going to save you. Because for years, for years, I have been thinking that, oh, this pill is going to help me. And hey, doc, it's not working. Well, I'll give you trinazepam. Don't even know what it means, but it's something new. So I'm like, that's going to fix me. Mm. But here's what I learned when I was in rehab. I was laying down in a bunk bed one day. I had a roommate and I was like, okay, wait, let me reflect on how my life is. I wake up at about 4 p.m. That was my wake up time. I wake up at about 4 p.m. I stay in bed for about two hours. And the thing I, first thing I probably do is watch porn and masturbate. That's how I start my day and start my mind. So that already says something. You're at like 4 or 5 p.m. Yeah. The first thing I do after that is consume whatever's on my social media feed. So comparison. Wow, that person's ripped. Oh, my God, they have a nice car. Oh, my God, this. So I'm already taking my baseline. My baseline's here. I'm already going way under. Through that, I'm vaping the whole time. Then I'm probably smoking weed. Then I'm starting to eat bad. Then by the time it's midnight, that's when my day really starts. And if I do want to shower that day, I'll shower. And then like 
I'll watch something, I'll binge something, I'll go on a dating app, I'll go to a massage parlor, like just things that are ruining my day. Mm. And then the first thing, the last thing I see before going to sleep is again, visually, porn on the laptop, as I'm vaping, with food by my bedside, ordering Postmates, waking up at 4 p.m. all over again. So when I was in rehab and they took away my laptop, took away my phone, took away my vape, took away my vices, and I started living a normal thing that normally in your 20s you learn that like, okay, routine, balance, discipline. I had a moment, I was like, wait, you're telling me if I go to sleep at a suitable hour, wake up at a suitable hour, don't watch porn, don't vape, don't eat bad, like don't do the way I'm living, I'm going to have energy where I don't feel like I need Adderall to give myself that energy. And it was a light bulb moment. Mm. And it was like, no wonder I was miserable. It just made sense. So to a person who's looking for it, I'll be like, just take a look at your life. You know what you're doing wrong. And yes, you're going to say, oh, but it's hard. Oh, but I need the vape. Like one kid asked me, he goes, um, dude, I can't stop vaping. I can't stop vaping. I was like, I want to stop. Yeah. yeah, I was like, he was like, I can't sleep without vaping. Mm. I was like, well, let me tell you this. One night of no sleep is not going to kill you. So throw all your vapes away. Do not even ask me for advice on how to quit vaping. If you have vapes in your home or access to vapes or friends that are vaping, go that nightless night without sleeping and it's not going to kill you. But I will tell you what will kill you and ruin your health. You continue vaping because you feel like you need it to go to sleep. So it's like a take a look deep reflection into your life and all the things will make sense. That's the hard thing to do though. It's it's so we we know what we're doing wrong. Yeah. It's hard to it's hard to admit that re, re, removing these things will actually help our life though. Oh, of course. Right, that's the hard part. That's the step. Um Dude, I know nothing about vaping. Uh-huh. I didn't even know there was an addiction to vaping. Oh. Is, it, is it nicotine? What's in vaping? It's nicotine. Mm-hmm. So a lot, of, it, it's the new and thing. And who, who knows what else that's going yeah. to cause well, other things. I definitely remember the trend. It seemed to be higher a couple years ago. I remember everything was vaping, vaping, vaping. Oh, no. So now. It's still still oh, now it's bad. like, I, I don't, you can't go in LA in a, in a party, which I don't attend anymore, to a restaurant and everything without like. People are vaping. People are vaping. Literally, like yeah. uh, yesterday, we were at that uh, restaurant right when I landed. There was I, I saw six people who had a vape in their hand while they're eating in the restaurant. So I just don't notice it. Yeah, and that's the best thing ever. I literally never saw that. I used to vape in the airplane, in the um, in the doctors, in my mom's house. No matter where it was, vaping. And a lot of the vapors out there, and I'm gonna look at you when I say this. A lot of you justify the vaping and say. I'm not addicted to the vaping. What I'm addicted to is the action of doing this. Mm. That's a lie and that's a justification for yourself because I promise you, I used to wear whistles and I was like, or whistles that just have no ends at the bottom. So whenever I felt like vaping, I would pick it up and do this. It's not the same. There are chemicals in those things, which now it's flavored, blueberry, banana, Mm. strawberry. There's so many chemicals where it's just, you think it's anxiety reducing, but it's actually anxiety inducing mm-hmm. because the, those things are corrupting the mind, correcting, corrupting the soul and everything. Highly addictive. Country, what do you know about vaping? Well, I, I ain't never used a drug in my life, and that's, that's the God honest truth. Um, most that's I amazing. have is like a mojito time to time and, <laughs> and a Moscow mule. But um, I have had many friends in my life that are very close to me that um I I'm sitting back listening to you and I have I was one of those family members seeing something from a distance and I think you hit the the nail right where is that you you people that really genuinely love you they see these 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 things and you know it's hard for someone to make a drastic change until they come within themselves willing to make that change mm-hmm. And I commend you for that. I applaud you for that, man, for making that that choice and and recognizing it and seeing it. Because some people, man, are just lost in life. They don't even see it, and it's most it's heartbreaking to like see family members like going across that that line where you see those moments. So mm-hmm. you know what's interesting on that point, and we're gonna drop a lot of gems this episode. And if I started it on two like. No, I, I think I took you there. I took it you there. I, I was going to start the podcast. <laughs> Light and happy. happy and now here we are like. Ugh. 
Yeah. But I hope you guys do take time to really, this is going to be a very, a lot of important conversation. Something he just said is so important. So my mom would see me do the wrong things for so many years. She would want to help me. She would try to help me. But here's what's funny. When my mom would tell me, Yusuf, do you really need to be vaping right now or stop vaping? I would get angry at her. Mm. But here's the catch. I would get angry at my mom who loves me, who was trying to protect me from something that was ruining me. Where was that same anger and mad or you know energy when a friend was supplying me with vapes, alcohol, and weed and Adderall? Those things were actually hurting my life. So when I look at somebody online and I'm yelling at them because I have a very harsh way of motivating, I'm like, just stop, stop vaping. And they get mad at me like, who are you to yell at me to stop vaping? Right. Yet a friend is willing to give them anything and they're like, I love you, bro. Yeah. That's yeah. tough. That's a distorted relate yeah. sense of relationship. It's how, like how is that? How is that more? I got your back than the person trying to get you to quit. Exactly. That's crazy. It's like, and I try to tell them that I'd be like, "Yo, I love you," and that's why I'm telling you this stuff. Mm -hmm. Can Can I ask a question here? And we all n have been with your family. Your mom is a remarkable woman. It's key to the foundation to the hub. Um. She must be at her proudest moment right now, seeing where you at in life right now. And how is that relationship taking place now? You know, she's she's super proud um, and she's super happy. But as a mother, I can see that there's still that fear inside her of I hope this lasts. I hope yes. this stays because yes. In, in her eyes, she's seen me change the outside so many times. This time, like what you said in the beginning, it was different because foundationally, I changed the inside, which as a byproduct, it changed the outside. So all I can do now, I can't get mad at her for doing that because like she's seen it so many times, but I have to just keep proving to her. So every time I call her, it's not like, mama, I'm back in you know rehab. Like when my brother got told from my sister, my oldest brother, Hey, Yusuf had an incident. He's back. My brother goes, again? He goes, he was doing so good this year. Here's the caveat. That year was the worst year I had done, but I had just gotten so good at hiding it. Mm -hmm. I was drinking more, vaping more, taking more pills, smoking more, having more uh, unprotected sex and, you know, doing whatever. But because financially on the outside, it looked like I was doing so good. I was hosting the YouTubers, TikTok or boxing event. Somebody like my brother's watching that being like, yes, he's killing it. So that's why to him to see me to revert. But I just have to keep showing up and keep showing my mom like it's serious this time. Mm -hmm. It's serious this time. But the relationship with my mom has become so much more like honest. So like I like when I was in rehab, I had a landline and obviously one of the only numbers I know is my mom. So I would call her and give her updates. And we were actually talking. Um, you know, I've talked to her for years, but I, I, I lied to my parents for years. Like, how are you? I'm good. Meanwhile, I'm literally upstairs in Roman's home crying while on tour. There were vlogs I recorded crying in your household, mm -hmm. crying. And I would just lie and be like, I'm good, but I wasn't. Whereas now, if I'm not doing good or I'm doing good, I could just be honest and say, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. The smile can be such camouflage. It can, yeah. but it's interesting because now, so my biggest thing in rehab was, um, I don't, uh, like when I, when the incident happened and I hit up my manager at the time and I said, yo, I messed up. I was like, I really messed up. And so-and-so happened. He said, I know a guy. Now by hearing that you think, oh, I know a guy to protect you from this situation. Mm -hmm. Whereas when my manager called him, it wasn't, Hey, get Yusuf out of this situation. It was, you have been managing Yusuf for the last year. And he, every time he drinks, he puts himself in a problematic situation. He's not doing good. He's stressed. He's depressed. And he was like, how can I help him? And then the guy he reached out to said, I'm only willing to help him if he's willing to help himself, which then got me to submit and go to rehab. Um, so, but my whole thing was, I didn't want people to think rehab was just a mask to be like oh guys i know i did something wrong on this reality show but i went to rehab mm -hmm. and it wasn't because i didn't even have to tell people or shove it down their throats that i went they saw their ch the change on their own Brittany and i we've we've posted this on social media but we're both three years sober and that's something we did congratulations together. and thank you we we never fight ever we've been together mm. forever multiple lifetimes 
And we, the only time that her and I would fight, argue, bicker, punch with, things, was with alcohol. There you go. Do you remember that? Having to go get his hand wrapped up. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. we were on tour. Were we yeah. on tour? During tour, yeah. Punched a wall, broke my hand. <laughs> I don't think that we've ever actually told that story. Yeah, but the whole, I don't even remember. That. Oh, yeah, I had to. Have. I think I had to either like go out and get you yeah. or DJ that night because yeah. we were fighting so bad. Not like so bad, like I don't. I don't remember actually fighting. Bad. I fought the wall. Uh, 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 uh. No, I broke my. You were like mad at me because I wanted to spend time with you and you had to edit the vlog, and I was like, "You do this every single night." Vlog is life. Yeah. Get away and you from were me, intoxicated. girl. Intoxicated. Yeah, al- yeah, always. We'd do our show. We'd have champagne. Mm-hmm. We'd, but for Brittany and I, alcohol was what's something we can remove out of that life, out mm-hmm. of our life that's affecting our career, affecting our family, mm-hmm. our home, our relationship. That was our alcohol. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we both cut that out of our lives not that we didn't have an amazing relationship already but it's just gotten so much better mm-hmm. and if one person in that relationship drinks the other one doesn't mm-hmm. it's it's alcohol is chaos chaos mm-hmm. it is yeah you know, and I'm also older. I'm not I'm not 20 anymore, dude. I'm not in my 20s. Three things to that point. <laughs> <laughs> I have like three things to say. One, when I look back at anything that was bad in my life, alcohol was always associated with it. Mm-hmm. So I got punched when I was in a fraternity, which got me to move back home from San Jose State and then start Fousey Tube. I was blacked out drunk when I got punched. Reality show, blacked out drunk. So it's like it's always alcohol. alcohol. Um, two, I forgot what two was. From the alcohol. Um, but uh, from the alcohol, <laughs> a residual brain loss that's still impeding into my life. Um, but three, so my ex-girlfriend, um, even though I'm sober now, she was, she still drank and I'm not going to impose my lifestyle onto her. Right. But one thing that I did notice is when she started hanging out with me, by default, she just wasn't drinking and she wasn't going out. And then I wanted to make sure she was, a because I, I told her, you know, you're allowed to drink. And I, because I, I, I talked to my mentor who uh, his, you know, I don't know how to talk about his wife and his situation, but he said, yeah, you are allowed to have a partner that drinks as long as they understand your boundaries. But one thing I noticed is, so she, we, she wouldn't drink, she wouldn't go to the club, she wouldn't party. But then when we broke up or if there was a break or anything, she would so it's like are you only not doing that stuff thinking you have to do that with me or are you actually adapting or adopting that into your own lifestyle which was interesting so to hear that you guys both made that commitment for yourselves and it just works that's beautiful for us it was only going to work doing it together Mm -hmm. it it was a commitment together not one of us is going to drink we both are going to stop and it's Mm -hmm. crazy how we've turned like we're like the old parents now at every every get together. We're we the don't eat boring. Junk food. <laughs> We're like even listen to this podcast. You guys are probably like, man, they're just taking everything fun away from us. <laughs> no, it's it's a very personal journey, and it's uh, you know I'm 39 years old. Mm-hmm. Like I'm raising children and trying to build this home. You have and kids, this business. You have four kids. Now. Wow. Yeah, we haven't seen each other for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's funny. The other day I was at a boxing event. A lot of my life is around boxing now, like on the promotional end of things. And also I'm getting in the ring this year, but I was at a boxing event and now not drinking, being sober, I have natural energy mm. and people literally like, they'll be like, this dude's on Coke just cause of how much natural energy I have. Granted, I'm not on anything. But the most bizarre thing happened when I was on the fi- at the fight. I was there and I wanted a Diet Coke and I wanted a water. And I look at the bar line and it was like, I'm telling you, like half a mile long. Mm-hmm. And in my head, I'm like, these grown men, and this is not to put down anybody who drinks or anything, but it's just uh, explaining my vantage point. These grown men were willing to wait in these long lines to pay an absurd amount of money to buy a watered down alcoholic beverage because it's obviously not going to be enough to get you lit or whatever you expect it to because they have conditioned themselves to feel like in order to enjoy the moment or enhance the experience, they have to resort to that alcohol, not realizing they have everything they need to enjoy that experience within them. Yeah, I will say this. I will say this. Uh, When we quit drinking, I remember going to a country concert it was one of the most painful <laughs> things i've ever done bro sober I, I i didn't know how to have fun without alcohol like for real really concert. for real 
I was, I was, it was hell for me. Uh huh. I, this is so, I need alcohol to enjoy this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I remember going through that. Wait, he like, made me leave early. I couldn't do it. I Luke Brian got on and he's like, we have to leave. But, like, but this here's, is what I've been waiting here's, for. Here's the other situation. You made her miss Luke Bryan? No, no, no. We listened to enough, Luke. <laughs> here's, 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 here's the second side of it. That was also the first time I experienced being sober and taking photos with fans all night that are drunk. Oh. So I'm sober. I'm not having that much fun. And I'm being like, hug. Everybody drinking is very physical. Mm. Oh, this far away mm. from you. And they're, they're sweaty and they're all over me for... I put I, I did do it for many hours mm -hmm. and I eventually broke down. I was like, I gotta go. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not having fun. Mm -hmm. But that was like a weird moment. That is an interesting point because I I for some reason I didn't have that. Oh, I can't have fun without alcohol. Right out of rehab, I went to a front row at a J Cole concert, and J Cole's meant a lot to me. Yep. And I got to experience it sober for the first time, and I actually remember the concert for once. I had fun. I was rapping word for word. But one thing I don't like about now being sober is when you're drunk and somebody else is obnoxiously drunk and interacting with you, it's of no concern. You guys are both wasted. Yeah. When you're sober and a person is there, like, they're just, what's up? Who's she? Like, mm. It's just like, it's off-putting to me. It's like, mm. whoa, like, this is, this is a bit intense. It's a bit much. And I know, like, they're going to wake up the next morning and be totally fine and not even remember, but it's intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is different when you're yeah. the sober one. Yeah. And we've become the sober people now. I, 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 we, we don't get invited to many things anymore. Dude, I spent a year. Um, this was COVID. This is 20. I believe I was streaming on uh, a, a platform. I won't say the name of for about a year. I think 2020. Not exactly sure. Every night. Because I'm in front of a live audience and I actually have to entertain them live and mm -hmm. I have to have personality. So I had conditioned myself to think I needed to do it by drinking and smoking weed every night. It gave me the alias Wine Foose because people knew when Wine Foose is out, it's crazy. Yeah. I have removed all those videos and everything. I don't remember that time in my life or anything because what I thought was actually entertaining and giving them life and everything was actually they were just enjoying watching the 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 car wreck they were seeing me implode my life like flirt with girls make out with them on stream and do everything so i'll take this harnessed energy over that unfacilitated like crazy energy any day of the week yeah any day and and, and we did it on tour every night where's the champagne oh get yeah the champagne get oh, the yeah. Jack and Cokes before we walk out on stage and it like makes you feel like that's what you need to perform. That's what you need to loosen up. That's, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an addiction for real. Oh yeah. Um, on that, but on that, before we, we move on. So I, so I used to never think I was an alcoholic quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I used to think my only addiction was my sex addiction. Granted, I have an addictive personality, so I can get addicted to anything under the sun, anything under the sun. And it wasn't until rehab where they were like, if you even black out one time a year, that could be enough to say you have a problem. And I'm like, I thought the point of drinking was to black out, <laughs> literally, because I blacked out every night. And I think of times and I don't even I'm not even proud to say it where I would be on dates behind a vehicle with my Tesla letting it drive. Like there were just horrible decisions mm -hmm. that I was making in my life. But alcohol, once I quit that out of my life, like that's not a thing that I fear in my sobriety. Mm. I know the benefits of not drinking. I never needed alcohol. And like, I don't even, that's not even what I worry about. Now, my sex is something I have to stay on top of, um, anything else. But the alcohol was like, out, gone. Mm. Good riddance. Don't need you. Give me water. Give me black coffee. I'm good. I hit that point too. I kind of was done with it. But I'm also... Uh, I, you know, I got older. I got older. If I was in my in my young twenties, I'd be I'd probably be like, "You're crazy." I'm gonna I'm gonna go in on this. You know, that's a very good point because something about that is what's so dope about I think ours. We came in such a we had a lot of kids watching us when we started YouTube, mm -hmm. and now they're like. So when I used to talk about depression back in the Dosa Fusi vlogs, it would be kids saying. You're faking it for views. What's depression? You're lying. Mm -hmm. 
but now those same kids are adults. Yeah. So now they're going through the same things that they remember Fusi going through and are able to relate on a different level. And I get messages all the time. Yo, when I was a kid, I used to hate on you for talking about depression, OCD, but man, my life now is like, and it's so dope. Just like, so I forget that with age comes that, you know, understanding yeah. and growth that I, 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 I never really understood while going through it. So I, I do want to say a lot of the things you might be hearing, you might it not might be receptive to you or hitting, but that also might come from just where you're at in life. Things happen like things you wouldn't accept. Like, yeah. Anyways, I want to cut that off to say, did you read my book at all? Because you're mentioned in it and it's about your guys' relationship. You have a book? I do. I, I, I'm ashamed of it. So I didn't um, promote Why? it a lot. Um, the, my book is 100% honest and truthful, right? 100%. And I talk about everything from my sex addiction to the Adderall abuse, everything, things you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. The issue with the book is it was written by an addict who was written, writing it from a um, sober or healed perspective. And that was the biggest lie. Because mm -hmm. I was an addict while writing it and still an addict. I wasn't ready to write that book. Got it, got it, got So it. to me, there's shame in that and knowing I'm selling them an image or a story about like, hey, yeah, this is my horrible 10-year addiction story, but I'm healed now, whereas I wasn't healed. Mm. So if like if I were to come out with another book, which would be years from now because I want to get all this growth and actually run with it and have years of sobriety under my belt, one of the first lines would be, hey, remember that first book that you read where I was healed? Bullshit. Hmm. Hit and put button. that out there. Hit, Hit the, the button. button. <laughs> so how long are you sober now? Uh, if long? I had my phone, actually, do I have it on my thing? Um, I got sober September 15th of 2021. Um, I just wanted to, I have a sober app that counts the days. I wanted to tell you the exact day. It, this says it. Oh, I have to open it on my phone. September 15th of 2021. So I think this month on the 15th is nine months. Heck yeah, dude. That's Congrats. Awesome. Thank That's you. That's massive. Good for Thank you. you massive. You can and see it. And it's it. one day at a time. Mm -hmm. So when I was in rehab, a lot of the people, this is a very important note too. A lot of the people were like, we'd have like, we'd have our seminars and then go together with all the guys. Um, and the guys would be like, dude, there's no way they expect me to never drink again. Like, I'm going to have to drink at a wedding. I'm going to have to drink at a concert. Yeah. And they were here, still not even w sober, thinking about a moment that's here. Not understanding that sobriety is not being like being on day zero, being like, yeah, I'm going to go a year sober. You're setting yourself up for failure. Mm. But the best way to do it is I'm going to be sober today. Mm. You wake up that next day. I'm going to be sober today. So on this app that I have that actually each day you can make a daily commitment to yourself, you make the vow. It says, today I pledge to remain sober from, in my case was uh, masturbation, porn, alcohol. I press pledge and by the end of the night, it reminds you and it says, how did you do? Day completed. Oh, that's cool. And then you redo it again, that make that pledge cool. for the next day. That's amazing. Yeah. So although I'm nine, I'm coming up to nine months now. I don't look at it like that because I'm like I'm sober today. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Some of my funnest memories in life have actually been with you. We did a tour together. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody listening, watching, probably knows of this tour. It's the uh, Roman versus Fuzzy. Bro, that was fun. That was fun. That's how we met country. Mm -hmm. um, and now he's a major part of our life and this podcast. And uh, just what a cool experience. I've never got to do that. Um, it's crazy how we have such different experiences because getting booed every night and hearing no. Roman. Ro I'm just kidding. No, was, we had this wildly even crowd. Well, it was awesome. no, no. Don't even you say think? that. Don't even say that. It was a Roman smile more dominated tour and no. army. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I, there was a lot. There was at mm, you least. Had, you had many fans. Yeah. You yeah. Had many yeah. Fans. But it was just it, it was just different. But here's why it happened. The tour was Roman versus Fusi. So in the show, the whole point was the first act. We're beefing. 
I'm better than you, I'm better than you. Yeah, and then yeah. that second act, we break down the imaginary wall and come together. Yeah. But the audience took that to heart. So when I'm throwing jabs at you and like <laughs> yeah. throwing those sock and boppers, they were like, no, don't, don't give it. But the best part about that, the rap battles that we did between oh, the fans. Oh, man. That was so It fun. was just fun. It was a fun experience. Yeah. Getting to, that, that's where I learned about our fans. I had no clue the mm. the impact that we had mm -hmm. during these daily vlogs. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time I experienced meet and greets where people are sharing their life and how we've changed their life and helped them not commit suicide. And that's where I learned it all. That's where I learned how much merch we were selling. When the crowd showed up and they're rocking Smile More, mm -hmm. that's where I learned so much about our audience. That's where I learned how young they were. Mm -hmm. um, I... Um... I forgot the point I was just going to say, but the memory that sticks in my mind is getting on the tour bus after and they would like the, the audience would give us so much Swedish fish. I think we had a Swedish fish addiction or you did, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. which then got them to give it to me. And I would eat pounds of Swedish fish each day on the tour bus, like insanely. And I remember on the tour, me and you would always look at each other and being like, we're living a once in a lifetime opportunity and experience right now. And mm. let's not take that for granted. And now looking back at those pictures, that's exactly what I feel. It really like. was. Uh, it it's was out really of a special. dream. It was, it was rock really star yeah. lifestyle, mm -hmm. actually. It was really special. So it holds a special place. Um, I still, I still don't really understand how we pulled that off. <laughs> it's like, we did, we had tour rehearsals. We put a whole show together. Yeah, we wrote like, it together. It was actually a good, good, good tour. I wish one of the whole things was recorded. We never did that. Mm. We never recorded the actual show. Yeah. Cause we didn't want to give up what the show was. Yeah. But it was silly. It was fun. You should have done it on the last one though. It was yeah. heartfelt. It's all right. So. We'll be back on the road. 2023 y'all <laughs> book your yeah. tickets now. <laughs> yeah. But to bring up, uh, I don't want to keep going back to alcohol, but. A story I don't think I've ever told was I when I used to actually daily vlog every day. I mean, that was my commitment. Mm -hmm. That's like the most important. Some days. That was the most important thing in my life was to make sure that at 3 p.m. every day there was a vlog. Mm -hmm. And and I did this for 500 and yes, 550 mm -hmm. days maybe. And the reason I missed 551 was because I got drunk. Oh. And that was a big eye opener. Like. Of, Puking out of the side of an Uber drunk. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. But great example of affecting my career, affecting my life, affecting my family. Uh, I missed my first daily vlog because of alcohol, because of my choices, right? So I don't want to keep going back to alcohol, but that's another story of, of it affecting. Basically, if I were to give a takeaway from every time you brought up alcohol in this podcast, it's that anything that negatively happened in your life was due to... Not anything negative. Not cause, everything. Because being sober doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. <laughs> Did you hear Britt? What? She said, not everything. We have a couple of kids. <laughs> <laughs> Families were created with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. I and that that's a point, though, I want to go back on. A lot of people think that because, like, I'm sober now that life just becomes sunshine and rainbows. It's actually the opposite. And they say the first year of sobriety is your hardest because, get this, I just went through a breakup. In the past, I go through a breakup. Cool. Let me numb myself by vaping, smoking mm. weed, drinking, going on a Spine dating app, time. having sex by, with somebody else to compensate. When you're sober, you go through that breakup and it's, wait, I have to sit with these feelings. Mm. I have to feel the heartbreak. Mm. I have to feel the pain. And I can't do anything to numb myself out of it. It's, it's, it's not easy. And that's yeah. why they say the first year of sobriety, you're not supposed to get in a relationship. And is that a thing? It's a thing. hundred percent. It's the, it's the coming off of it's tough. Yeah. You're not supposed to get in a relationship. It's like a double edged sobriety. sword because the relationship could get you through the year, but if you don't make it with the relationship, then it's, mm -hmm. yeah. That's and there's, there, there are so many things like the first year you're very vulnerable. You're still like, you're receptive to everything. Like, mm. So you have to be very careful in that first year. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to like learn how to do things again, I feel mm -hmm. like. Wow. It's like re like yeah, you're relearning yourself. Mhm. Mm you're 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 finding figuring out your identity, who you are. That's why even this year I see myself going through progression stages like in the beginning I started like, okay, let's go for a run today and think thing thing and now I'm like I like to liken myself as like the future david goggins <laughs> i don't know if you guys know who he is yeah i know who he is um but like and i see myself with time and like the more money i put in the bank and what i mean by money is 
the more time I stay sober, the more runs I go on, the more workouts mm -hmm. I do, the more mental health practices I do. That's money. That's the money I'm putting in the bank. The, the richer I get in terms of a person, not monetary value, but rich in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. soul, spirit, health, happiness. One of the worst things that happened to me, 16 years old, my first car, I would, uh, I would start this car up in the morning, winter time. You have to let the thing warm up. Um, well, I ended up getting very sick, very sick. Like I thought I was dying every single night. I felt my body leaving my body. It was the craziest feeling I can ever explain. Wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, many months went by, many hospital visits. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. Um, I take my car in to get a tune-up, which is my uncle, who's the mechanic. He calls my dad and said, I think I know what's wrong with Roman. There's no exhaust on this car. So I'm breathing carbon monoxide every Ooh. day. You know, this is going into my body. I think it saved me from ever trying drugs. Because I, I couldn't have anything that would make me feel weird. So even with alcohol, it took me. I never drank alcohol until I was much older because I was too scared to feel like I was having carbon monoxide poisoning again. So that was a big save for me because all my buddies in school were doing drugs. You know, not all of them, but they were trying <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And for me, it made me feel too weird. I couldn't touch it. So I'm always thankful for that horrible life experience, but it got me away from feeling odd and off so i just never went down the road of any type of pill or yeah i hate taking advil like i literally mm. don't like anything that might make me feel weird mm -hmm. that's why when country said he's never done drugs i'm like good because like when people go like oh i've never vaped before i say good for you because god forbid you try it and then like mm. oh this is this is nice i like it so it's like mm. when a lot of people like it's weird um you didn't do this, but they justify their not doing drugs. Like, yeah, I've never done that. I'm sorry. It's like, well, what are you saying? Sorry for like, good for you. I'm mm -hmm. proud of you. Good. Like, yeah. stay away from that. It's yeah. like, it's kind of like when cigarette smokers, whenever you ask a cigarette smoker, like, or you say, I don't smoke. They say, good, don't smoke. Yet they're smoking. It's so mm -hmm. backwards. It's like, you're telling me not to smoke a cigarette, but you have done seven in this conversation. Because yeah. you know how addicting it is. So addictive. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys have a new addiction, and I'm, I'm on the back burner. You guys are training, working out. You're, you guys have reconstructed your bodies to, like, not only, like, I'm a fan of all three of you guys, of watching your journey on what you guys are doing. Like, why fitness? Well, what is, what is happening with that? that where you look at yourself in the mirror, you see how many times I've been trying to get this guy to go to the gym with me and, and an instantly team effort. They're together, they're, they're in the gym and now he's rocking it out better than a partner is doing. I don't even ask Roman for advice. I'm like, Brittany, talk to him. Like, <laughs> like, 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 and what's, what, what's interesting, what's interesting is this. I don't, I don't go on social media mm -hmm. and look for the guy that I want like the body from, my biggest inspiration that I've been following, not only journey where I happen to be in Brittany's life, but I ask the questions that when I ask people that actually in working out, they look at me like, look at you, look at the size of you, mm -hmm. like how you don't know this. And I'm like, I'm also embarrassed to ask those questions because people assume that mm -hmm. I do work out and I'm physically strong, like I know these answers. And so, me, I get some of my greatest information from people that that's not going to backlash on me. I, I get concerned about that because people think I have a formula. How, how does that work with you? Like when, how does the formula work with you, Brittany? I want to like, hear you know, with, Brittany, with, with, I, I take inspiration from her yeah, too. Like, like recently on her Instagram story, she was doing a no sugar thing. And instantly, like, it's like monkey see, monkey do when you want to adapt to something mm -hmm. and you see it working for them. Yeah. I bugged her instantly. So, wait, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me what. Pussy was in my DMs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, follow this person, do this. Okay, yeah. next thing I know. just asking about sugar this time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, and, I, and I, I, I followed the Odoo, so I want to hear. I think it's more about, it's not about physical, it's about mental. It's like that your gut. Everything that goes in your body, everything that goes on your body, lotions, chapsticks, everything controls your mind. And I think being able to be mentally strong comes from what you're eating. 
rather than what you're looking like. I think that's kind of where it really started. There's a me. reason we crave all this crap. Yeah, yeah. and I, I agree with yeah. that because you know how they talked about when alcohol was in the picture they fought? With my ex-girlfriend, we found that the days I had cheat days and allowed myself to have like Halo Top ice cream or anything that contained sugar, mm. sugar literally changed my temperament, changed how I acted, changed my attitude and energy. Mm-hmm. Where to the point where she made a like a boundary and she said, no more sugar for you. Before I even saw this stuff, she said, sugar affects you negatively. And mm-hmm. if we are going to do it, it's one day a week on Saturdays. You're allowed. But we're at home doing nothing when you do it. So a lot of the things that like I was doing wrong was basically what I was consuming. Mm-hmm. And not realizing that like what, what, what I'm digesting is what I'm becoming. Like that's what's affecting my mind. Mm-hmm. So this time I always used to, like I said work out in fitness and change my external but that's like having a lamborghini type style car on the outside but on the inside you're riding a go-kart like yeah. it's mm-hmm. what it, like okay cool looks good on the outside but this is taking you nowhere mm-hmm. and that's how it was when i only did the outside but once i changed the inside what went into my body what my eyes consumed even taking out the porn taking out all that stuff what my ears consumed It like it changed everything to the point the outside had to look good to keep up with how good the inside Mm -hmm. was looking and feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was for me. So now it's like I don't even worry about like, oh, do I look good today or anything like that? Because I know if I'm all good on the inside, it's by itself going to change the outside. And it has. Yeah. Like it has. Everything's so addictive, man. Everything's addictive. Just like the bad is addictive, the good was just as addicting Mm because it's like, oh, I want to keep feeling this good. Mm -hmm. I want to look this good. So the reason I eat it is because I feel good. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't care for eating it. You know, Mm -hmm. the bad foods is just so good. Uh, Have let me ask you. It tastes good. Yeah, yeah, it tastes good. Let me let me ask you this question. So, you on the outside looking at him, and and Brittany, like, what you have seen the transition in him, Mm -hmm. and I want to talk about something about my favorite part of the tour. A lot of people don't know that arm wrestling match was real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that arm wrestling uh-huh. match, you guys were literally like, <laughs> I want to say that was a competition. So that for, that for, competition yeah. was really was like, I'm going to get you tonight. Yeah, that was the only part of the tour where that like, because we knew who would win or lose each thing. Yep. Um, but that was the only thing that whoever would win it, and I could not beat Roman. Yeah, ever. so uh, every night on tour, Fusi and I would arm wrestle. And we had a real arm wrestling table. And the whole point of this tour was to see who would win. And most things were set up, but the arm wrestling was real most of the time. Mm-hmm. Until most our arms started hurting after night after night. Oh, after and did we night. just let you, you win? Would come, you'd come backstage, you'd be like, I can't do another. My arm hurts so bad. Um, we would actually go at it. We would go at it. You have abnormal strength. But everybody assumed that was fake because I would beat you. And at that time, I was a scrawny kid, mm-hmm. man. <laughs> but it has nothing. Armor also, as we you know, has nothing to do with your bicep and stuff and so much with the forearms and just, I don't know, you have some scary. Just lifting, lifting, some, that, <laughs> lifting that at wood rope. <laughs> yeah, really. But on the outside, exactly yeah. what you said about looking at like Roman, when, it, when Roman started posting like shirtless pics and seeing yeah. i was so like a happy and proud but be just astonished like where did this come from because like you said he would never like he was mm-hmm. just he was cool with you know living life as is you because yeah. and you are in the capacity where you don't get fat yeah you could get skinny fat but like yeah. you're not about to put on like foosy weight i can't gain weight so you didn't have to be like, yo, I want to make this change. But you still did because you saw what being fit physically did to you mentally and everything like that. Like when I work out now, it is so much not for my aesthetics, but it's like I'm stressed today. Well, I haven't ran. I haven't worked out. I haven't released this energy. Mm-hmm. But working out does that. It's like my release. It's mm-hmm. like I have to. If I don't work out, you will see a change in my like energy, my temperament, wow, and everything crazy like that. You said that. You said the same thing. Mm-hmm. You were just talking about that. Like I can't go throughout my day without working out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it becomes an, it's its own addiction. Yeah. I can't go out a day without you know 
go and get number five, you know, <laughs> at Mickey D's. I like you know? food. You know, I like food. I, like I, I think, I think that's, that, that journey you guys are on is like really amazing. Mm -hmm. And are you, tr well, what's the training for now? Like, what, 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 what is the, you're, you're yeah, training. You just mentioned you're, this yeah, I, yeah. I, I will say yeah. that, but can I say something before that? Of course. I want to talk about what changed my relationship with food. So when I was in rehab um, in uh, August, the month before September of 2021, August comes before September. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I was in rehab in September. Sorry, whatever. You know what I mean? The, yeah. the re sobriety date was September 15th, which was the day I entered rehab. We were eating cafeteria food in rehab every day. And it got to the point where I walk in there, even the smell was like, no. Like, I'm not eating this today because it's like cafeteria food. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not eating this. So one day, I'm about 220 pounds. You know, I, I, I'm puffy. And because a lot of the stuff and the chemicals and stuff I'm eating and everything is making me, I was having an allergic reaction and not even realizing it. Like I was walking around swollen for mm. so long where it looked like I was sicker than I actually even was. And one day I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do a water fast today. And then I ran it by the counselor um, at the rehab and she said, absolutely not. We need you to eat because they conditioned you to say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You have mm -hmm. to eat five times a day. You have to eat this. And that's what I've been conditioned to believe my whole life. So I go, I'm going to do a water fast, but I'm not going to tell them. So I go through that whole day, just water. Woke up the second day and I was like, you know what? I, I feel good. Let's do it again. That whole second day, just water. Now, here's where the tricky part came. The third day, which to me when I do water fast is the hardest. I wake up that morning and on the menu for that day, they were giving us a chicken sandwich, like the Popeye's chicken sandwich. Mm. And the inside joke between all the men at the rehab was there was a Popeye's down the street. How are we sneaking off the campgrounds to go to Popeye's, mm. get this and come back? Everybody and now they were it. giving it to us. <laughs> Everybody wanted it. I immediately broke into like hives like... Guys, should I break my fast? Guys, I should break my fast today, right? I shouldn't fast today. Asking other people what I should do. I literally walked to the cafeteria with them, sat down as they all had their chicken sandwich, and I said, I want you to take a bite. If it's a 10 out of 10 on your rankings, I'm breaking my fast. If it's not, I'm not breaking the fast. They all ended up giving it a 7 or 8. I didn't break my fast. But here's where it got hard. Later that night, um, the it was a Friday, they were closing the convenience store on the rehab campgrounds for the weekend. So one of the brothers went in and bought like every chip bag you can, all the goodies, and came back in the snacks. My biggest kryptonite, a bag of chips. Because if I have one, it's not just one. It's the entire bag. I was literally sitting on the sofa, and all I could do was stare at this bag of chips. And I wanted it so, so, so bad to the point I had to excuse myself, go into the other room by myself. One of the brothers came in and had to sit down and talk to me emotionally as if, like, I wasn't taking drugs. I was addicted to the food, mm -hmm. and I needed it. I was salivating for it. I needed it like to the need to the point of like with my sex addiction, if I didn't go to a massage parlor, I felt like I would die. I needed it to the point where I felt like I needed it to survive. So I literally, he said, Yusuf, just take it easy tonight. Skip the seminar. You're going to get through this. I got through that night when I woke up on the fourth day in the morning, going to sleep on the verge of tears and needing it. I woke up and I taught myself something. I didn't need it. I got through without it. And I feel great that I didn't succumb to it. And breaking that fast that day, I knew I'm not going to break it eating a chicken sandwich, a burrito or something. I got to be careful of what I ingest now. So I mm -hmm. broke it with a couple of fruit. On the fifth day, a couple of fruit and salads. What that did for the first time in my entire life was change my relationship with food because I finally understood something. Food is fuel. And the only reason I'm eating is not for my satisfaction and to numb myself and to make me feel good as we're so used to like, because whenever we eat, we have that dopamine high and we get happy and we're like, ah, so we associate, I'm having a bad day, I need to eat. You're depressed, going through a breakup, ice cream. Mm. But for the first time in my life, I'm like, wait, I am not dying without this food. 
because I'm not starving. I'm hungry, but that comes from a mental aspect. So now, when if I need fuel to perform, I'm going to eat. And I'm going to eat things that actually are going to give me fuel. Not candy, not sugary things, but like my proteins, my good carb sources, my fruits. So for the first time, I didn't look at food as like, this makes me feel good, but I need this to perform good. Mm. And so now when somebody like, no disrespect to anybody, but when my friends be like, I'm so hungry, dude. I haven't eaten since 2 p.m. <laughs> and it's literally 3.30 and they went an hour and a half without eating or I didn't eat breakfast this morning. Don't talk to me. Right. I'm like, you know, it's, it's the relationship they have with food as opposed to them needing the food to perform because they ain't going to die. They're, 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 they're able to perform. They have so much. If you think about their carbs that they have ingested in them that they're using mm-hmm. for their energy, they right. can use that for God knows how long until it burns out, until they even get into a state of ketosis and start using fat for fuel. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. We have a lot of reserve in us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we keep eating on top of that reserve instead yeah. of burning the reserves. Um, I, I, I didn't see any real change until I changed what I was eating, 100%. Mm -hmm. I had to eat clean, clean beef, the best beef, cheese, um, just like pretty much proteins and fats. That's when I made the change. Yum. And that's when I felt my best, and that's when I said, okay, I get it. I get this. It does take a period of time to reset your gut microbiome to where your brain is happy because you do feel those like, I'm hangry. Like, Mm -hmm. I want Mm -hmm. food right now. Yeah, and it's certainly... It's not, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And that, that. But your, once it's reset, it, it, oh, it's not hard at all. Your skin starts looking better. Mm-hmm. Like you started thinking, you know what I do, what I did to reset. And I was actually telling Roman about this in the sauna today. Um, grown up conversation. I'm not recommending it to anybody. Consult <laughs> with your doctor. This is what I did. It's called a colonic, a colon hydrotherapy. Oh my God. You told me about this. So I'm hanging out with a, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I'm hanging out with a girlfriend of mine and she's telling me about it. Cause this one, I was overweight and unhappy. And she said, get a colon, uh, colon, not col- colonoscopy, col- yeah. colonic, colonic colon hydrotherapy. Yeah. I go, what is that? This? I know. I know. And right when she this. said they put a tube up your butt, I said, hell no. <laughs> yeah. Hell no. I'm a, I'm a grown man. I will never in my life put in. I ended up going the, and literally on the table, I'm like scared out of my life. And the lady's like, look, you don't have to do this. This old lady. I ended up doing it. And what it is, is they put a tube up your rectum and they fill your colon up with water. And then when you feel like you just have to release, you say, I have to release. She flushes it and it starts flushing everything that's been built up. The the bugs, the the total the gunk and everything out of your colon. Stuff that's been there for so long. Years. And it just flushes out and you're seeing it and you're like, that's inside you. And one thing I told Roman, <laughs> it wasn't even how it made me look. And yeah, I was a little flatter and I looked good. It was what getting that gunk out of me did to me mentally. It's like a fog was released from my brain and I'm like, whoa. And that actually, so like if I mess up and I, let's say, have a cheat day and I have carbs and I were to do that, it resets my system to where I can get myself back into a state of ketosis faster and use fats and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. I I recommend it to everyone, even though I said don't consult your doctor, like, you know, I would consult with your doctors, guys. But even grown men, like I would say, you would be a much happier person. Country gets those on the water slides. <laughs> but, there's, but there's a lot of doctors that yeah. still aren't up to date with all that stuff. Just like you talking yeah. to your person in rehab. They're like, no, you cannot do a water fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When that would be, especially going to rehab, that would be the best thing to start with is a fast. Well, the hardest That's thing. why I don't yeah. listen to doctors and stuff like that. But you know <laughs> about what my mom, you know how you're like, how does your mom feel? So when I was overweight, my mom would always say, Yusuf, start going to the gym. My dad is very strict with it. Yusuf, you're fat. You're ugly. Go to the gym again. That's just how he knows how to love. It's funny because now I'm skinny and everything. And guess what they say now? I went to my house the other day. And, you know, you have to be careful how you speak to somebody. You need to set boundaries even with your own parents. And the first thing um, my mom and dad say is like, you look sick. Uh, You look too skinny. Eat. And I'm like, so you were unhappy when I was fat and overweight. And now I'm, you know, I'm nine months sober. I'm happy. I don't do everything. But you're, you know, and that's why I'm growing a beard to that. And it makes it more full. But like, and now you're telling me I look too skinny. Mm-hmm. So it's like, check my health. 
check, let's see how my health is doing and everything. It's just, it's whatever. Yeah, I have a hard time with a lot of my family feels like, you know, your bones shouldn't be sticking out. You, you look way too skinny. I'm like, I still have like 20% body fat. Like there's still a lot of fat storage and it doesn't matter if I feel happy. Why, why should I be eating that cake if it makes me feel like crap? I threw my whole family under the bus when my mom said to me, when said that to me, we went to a family party the night before and I said, look at the entire Erica family. They're literally obese mm -hmm. and no disrespect to my family, but they were, they just let themselves go. The cousins, the uncles, the aunts that and everything. So good. And that was normalized and okay to, yeah. you know, them. But I'm like, but me who's working on his health and is so healthy, you had an issue. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say this. It's hard. Whatever you're doing is working. We're, we're sitting at dinner last night. This has never happened to me in my time. I don't know how much weight you have to lift. This <laughs> happen. Yeah. We're sitting at dinner last night. Nice restaurant. Oh my gosh. This girl comes up to Fusi and I'm like, oh, she's a fan. She just straight up comes up, hits on him. She's like, hi. You guys aren't going out tonight? Let me know if you're going out tonight. She's just so into him. She's like, Sure. And I'm like, and yeah. I'm like, this is never not one time in my life has a girl come up to me and hit on me. Never. Never. I mean, I can't say it happens to me either, but, and, and it was funny because she said she walked by us like seven times purposely wanting me to talk to her. And finally she came up and said, Hey, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I think you're really cute. Now, normally in my past, I would have been like, all right, I'm staying at this hotel. <laughs> this is my Instagram. So just so she can see how many followers I have and everything. But Yes, I watched her Instagram story, Brittany. <laughs> on the way. Just, <laughs> just to see. No, no, no. 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 Hang on, hang on. Yes. He says, we're driving home. First thing he says is where I'm at in my life. I don't want, I gave her my Instagram, but I want nothing to do with her. The next audio clip we hear in the backseat is you're, her videos. <laughs> I said, you're, you're on her Instagram, aren't you? He said, how did you did know? You? I had a new follower. I just want to see what her life was about. <laughs> did you ask her for a feet pic? No, <laughs> no. Oh, nothing. Wait, let's talk about, uh, let's talk, hang on. I need to talk about this real quick. Um, first, first podcast episode, mm -hmm. we talked about uh, Britney's an all-star in the feet pic world. Uh, she's got hundreds of pages <laughs> of her feet. Mm. And I got a lot of comments that says, Fusi says he has a foot fetish. Okay. So I, I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear more about this. Okay. What makes the foot attractive? What? Wow. I want to get to the bottom of this. Okay. In the unsober Fusi. First of all, real quick. Do you know anything about Britney's foot page? I didn't even know she had one. I haven't even seen a single picture of Britney's feet ever. Ever. Okay. Then you're not a I'm just trying to figure out who's running this. Yeah, page, I huh? promise. Oh, she actually has a... I never. And make sure you change the email so they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there are things you are attracted to in somebody else, whatever. Yeah. And like, when... I'm not going to lie. When I'm dating somebody, first of all, I don't look at strangers' feet and be like, those are cute feet. And when I'm dating somebody, it's like... If her toes are throwing up gang signs and like crooked and like not taken care of, it's not attractive to me. Right. When a girl's toe ratio, the length to her feet and the smoothness and the nice cuticles and the nice nail polish and the French tip is just done right. It gets you. Guess, Look at that smile. I know, I know. That's what I needed to hear. So, yeah. okay. So if, if she's throwing gang signs. Is that a, you're no longer dating? Yeah. No. Like, I, I would just know that off top, like, in the beginning. And also, like, and girls know that, like, um, oh, on my dating profile, one of the prompts used to say um, things I'm weirdly attracted to, girls with mismatched socks. One, every single girl wears mismatched socks at time to time and would like that prompt and be like, oh, my God, you're describing my life. But two, she's already receptive to the fact that, like, I like that. Why do I like socks and how it looks and knee highs and stuff? I don't know. But, yes, clean feet, amongst many other things, is one of the things that I look for. That's so interesting. Also, the size of the foot. Like, if and, – and, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying this because it's like you, you're allowed to have your likes and of dislikes. Course, so right. of if course. a girl has big feet, I'm just like – you're, you're, you're beautiful as all everybody is, but it's just not for I'm me. Just, I'm just, I'm just, we are just learning about how big this is. Oh, I, th I, thought, foot, foot, yeah, yeah, foot I thought I thought it was like a random dude attracted to Britney's feet. feet. Well, it turns out it's, it's, it's a, it's a real mm. thing. Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. A thing and a half. So I've heard that Brit's <laughs> a complete package. I thought it was like super trendy. 
like big butts were like a trend mm -mm. and then it's like feet feet have always been there we can have a conversation off stream and i can tell you more about why feet are off stream off off podcast and I, tell you people want to hear this the the foot thing is is hilarious to me. We're laying in the bed this morning. She puts her foot right in my right here. She's Did like, you Kiss hate my it? Toe. Did you hate it? I didn't even look at it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but in my head, I'm thinking, God, somebody would love to do that. Listen, oh man. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You know how blessed and you are. And it's not something I would normally do. <laughs> no, she, it, it's become this mm. this real like yeah. daily this, topic. Yeah. But yeah. you know, it's a man out there waking up that. It's a gang sign being thrown up in their oh, face and right now, with it. and yeah. he stuck with it. Like man, no, it's a, it's a bad, it's a bad place because we were in the shower yesterday, and and what do I think of? God, if I took a photo of your foot right now, it would get a ton of hits. Yeah, there are like those adult, That's so those weird. adult apps now, which I'm not yeah. gonna say the name of, where you can like subscribe to people. Yeah. Like one of the top requested thing to women are send me a picture of your feet. Send me a picture. Is of anything your feet. that have to do with the fact that the foot is usually hidden, so it's more like no, no, no. Not at all. It's, it's just, just like the toes and the size of the foot. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's a, like, let's say like a woman notices a guy's smile or chest or pat, whatever yeah, they're yeah. interested in. It's just one of those things. It's just that. Like, it's just, just that. It looks good. Like I like a, a nice <laughs> booby. You like a nice foot. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That's I like a nice point. foot. Fair enough. Um, so like me taking a picture of my feet, feet, is it like me showing a picture of my boobs? Don't like if don't post any pictures of your feet on socials because there are men out there who would like really really like that and it's like it's not there, a joke. There are girls on uh, streaming platforms like um, you know live streaming platforms where they don't even show their feet because they know like no I know that's wanted like it's more serious even for men's feet like uh, like I have a lot of people who comment on my feet never not one time for me. Maybe I'm throwing gang signs. You have, have polish have, on your have, toes, though. Have, have women asked you for for feet pics? For me, yeah. No, men have. Men have. Yes. Mm, I see. Men have. Because we were me and Ro Roman, we were like, like, is that a guy thing or is it a woman's thing? I don't know. I'd have to ask uh, a woman who's interested in feet on that, but I know it's usually the guy who likes women's feet. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, I don't want no gang toes. I think, in I, my think girls feet, God, I'm I think girls' feet are clearly more attractive if I had to pick a foot. Yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, I can't believe we got on this. Subject I, I didn't mean again. to. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really yeah. didn't mean to. Yeah. Um, I'll revert to something you asked about. Yeah. You asked about what am I training for? Exactly. <laughs> There we go. So, yes, change the subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, although I'm training for what we discussed, my mental health, mm -hmm. my spirit, my soul, and everything like that, um, in 2018, I was involved in a YouTube boxing match. Now, at that time, I knew nothing about boxing. I wasn't a boxer or whatever, but I had an ego. So, my ego told me, oh, I knocked that guy out, right? Had a month of training, knew nothing about boxing, went to London, put myself in a hostile environment, crowd, whatever, blacked out in the ring, got beat up so badly, my nose broke. Doctor told me I needed two surgeries. Doctor said, you can never get back in the ring again because it gets touched again. I don't even know how to reconstruct it. All that to say, this year, <laughs> I'm getting back in the ring. Let's go, dude. I will I'm, be proud wow. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, man. That's a Don't good... listen to doctors. That's what that is <laughs> And the podcast is flagged. <laughs> um, dude, that's that's a huge feat mm -hmm. and a big goal mm -hmm. that you could easily just skip. Mm -hmm. You know? No, it, it, it's it's true. My mom, my mom is against the idea. She's like, she literally, she swore. So in my and 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 the um the religion my mom follows so dearly. She like she swore to God that like if I do that she's going to disown me. Mm. Oh my God! Now what? she's you fighting me fighting me just stepping in the ring. Granted, I still had to disrespect her doing that and be like, Mama, like I have to do this. I have to do this. Wow! I have to do this. It's like it's not even a. It's not and. and so can I can I ask you? You just said you repeated. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Ever since that loss, people who, as they do with everything else in my past, have used that as a thing to throw me down. And they've tried to define my reality based on their perception of who I am and what my reality is. You suck at boxing. You're the worst YouTube boxer. You'll never win. Why I have to do this is because, A, I know that 
there are no limitations to what we can accomplish and what we can achieve. B, I want to show everybody before I even, I, the first thing, first thing first, I'm proving it to myself. I'm proving that this person today, this sober Yusuf who works day in and out on becoming the best version of himself can beat whoever steps in front of him in the ring. And I'm going to show people that. But I, well, the most thing I want to show people is, and this is what I would literally say in my speech, which I not literally say, what I'm going to say in my speech after I win my match this year is looking at it and say, this was to show y'all that your perception of who I am and what I'm capable of does not define find my reality. You guys all told me I can't box. You told me I'm the worst boxer. You told me I'm shit at boxing. I'll never be good at boxing. And I could have believed that and ran my whole life with it. It has nothing to do with what I'm capable of in life. So it's like, it's just, there's so much, like literally where I'm riding my motorcycle because I have to drive an hour to get to the gym every day to train because I actually have enough time to train this time. And I, I, I will be riding home. I'll get chills and tears down my face knowing how bad I want it. I've mm. never wanted something so more. Not doing it for the money, not doing it for the ego, but I'm doing it just because it feels like, like I, I, it's a, it's a need. It's a necessity. It's a must. Like people say, what about your nose? I say, I'll learn how not to get hit. Like it doesn't matter. I don't care. Like this is just, I cannot go the rest of my life and be on my deathbed and think when you were 32 years old and you had a chance to do that boxing match, you didn't take that chance because you were scared of breaking your nose. That's something I can't live with. I know that that representation and that portrayal that I did in boxing the first time was not any indication of who I am and what I'm capable of. Because like you said, I bounce back no matter through anything. Mm -hmm. I have resilience. A new manager that I just signed with asked me the other day, what's your, your favorite thing about yourself? I said, I don't quit. I don't know how to quit. So this is one of those things where I can't live with that being my only chance in boxing. I can't. It's like this, me wanting to be a motivational speaker, this is symbolic of that. This is like, yo, listen to my story, watch my story, look at everything. When I'm in, oh, I almost said where it's at, when I'm over there for the fight and I'm getting booed and hated on and people are throwing things at me and hating on me, look at that. Look at that. And it's going to mean something to the kids who actually do take something from what I say and do understand, yeah, he's fallen seven times, but I see that he's gotten up eight. And they've only fallen twice and think it's already done for them. It's going to give them a reason to stand up and try again. Mm -hmm. So this means so much to me more than anything else. It's like, it's just, ah. Do, wow. do people know who you're fighting? They will in about, maybe when this comes out, okay. um, it's, it's soon to be announced. Okay. It's, it's going to be a good fight. It's, it's going to be, be a good fight. It's going to be fight. a dog fight. It's going to be a great dog fight. fight. I'm so excited for it. Is, is this some... Man, I don't know what to say, but normally you hear a fight, the opponent doesn't respect their opponent and they hate their opponent. Mm -hmm. Is there a respect level there? Um, can I, say, can I ask there, that there, question? There's, this is going to be one of the biggest historic boxing fights on YouTube because of the history that I have with this gentleman. Um, there's been disrespect from both sides. There's been a big misunderstanding and everything. But in terms of me, my fight has nothing to do, to do with that. this kid wow nothing it has to do with me i am fighting myself i am in that ring against myself i am battling my demons my past my history he can like so he knows that like because obviously he doesn't post when he transferred doesn't post on youtube doesn't post on twitter instagram whatever he saw how hard i I've been training and working on myself. He started his camp early. He could be training as hard as he wants. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing and what I plan on doing for this fight. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I'm pumped. Yeah, I'm, this, this is something I want. Tony the Tiger yeah. coming out. Oh, I want <laughs> Do you know what you're wearing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know everything. I manifest this every day. It's all I think about. I eat, I eat it. I sleep it. Like, I want this. That's awesome. I want this badly. And when is this? <sighs> um... I don't think I can say the day yet because okay. it hasn't been announced. Okay. Coming. Yeah. Coming. Coming. Coming very coming. soon. Coming very soon. You will see. You will see me in the ring this year. It's going to be the biggest mm -hmm. event of the year. Mm -hmm. I, I now run, um, in terms of boxing, uh, not, not even a plug, but Happy Punch Promotions. It's a yeah. promotional YouTube boxing company that I have for, that I run with Keemstar. Yeah. Um, so we kind of like, we're the number one media source for social media boxing in the game right now. We have uh, a, like, 
eight fighters signed to Happy Punch who are also going to be fighting on the card that I'm on. Very cool. So it's like all I do um, is like uh, this boxing stuff. So I know all the events that are happening. This is going to be the biggest event of the year. Amazing and social media box. So if I want to, so. so if I want to get in the ring, you could put me in there. hundred oh percent. Find That's... find you like a forty year old. A hundred. I could put you in there <laughs> tomorrow. We have access to all the events. All right, come here, brother. Let's hug. <laughs> he just goes in there yeah. and starts dancing. Bro, I don't know. Yeah. Do, does Smilemore want to sponsor me and put a patch on my shorts and like pay for my training and all that stuff? Because that's allowed. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> I would. I would, totally would support you. I would. Lo- no, I'm yeah. serious. I'd rock Smilemore. Smallmore's always got you. Yeah, I have it on the patch on the shorts. Twenty everything. bucks a patch, or what is it? Huh? Twenty bucks a patch. Twenty. Um, add a couple Tw- of zeros. Twenty. 20. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could definitely talk about it. And that's sort of like what my year is building up on. So, like right now, me and my partner, like right now, I'll say this. So, this is the first time in my life. Um, I always covered my misery and everything through being financially stable. Because even when I was the most miserable and depressed, mm. I had millions in my account. Right now, I'm not scared to say money is not a big thing in my life. I don't have it. Mm. I don't have it. And in the past, like I barely had to do any work. I had, this is the thing YouTubers get blessed with um, when you're on and popping. Because everybody who's on and popping thinks it's going to last forever, but it mm. doesn't. I used to put in the least amount of effort, but get crazy rewards and returns. This is probably the first time in my life where I'm working harder than I've ever had, but I have no fruits of my labor to show for that. Mm. So it's not like I'm posting a YouTube video and getting money from it. My YouTube videos make about $50 a video now because it doesn't do anything. I'm working so hard on Instagram, TikTok, my fitness, and all I've seen is negative out of my bank account all year. Um, but me and my partner know that the momentum and the buildup and everything leading up to this fight, that sort of is like we're at like if you were to look at like an arc that goes like this. We're right here. Mm. So we have the option right now. Quit because we're not seeing anything in return and go backwards and stay there or keep grinding because that moment where takeoff is going to happen is going to happen. And that's going to happen with this boxing match. Yeah, man. Make, make, Make the money the byproduct. Yes. Yeah. Grind. I'm doing what I love. Yeah. I'm doing what I love every day. Yeah. So you're boxing. Who's one of your idols? Like, like, have you have any mentorship, anybody who's giving you guidance, advice from behind the scenes or anybody? Well, my, my, my team, my coaching team is phenomenal, phenomenal right now. Um, I'm at, uh, I don't even want to say this, but my opponent isn't here, even though I know they still know everything I'm at, but I have a, I have a great, uh, a great team around me right now. But some of my favorite boxers, like I'm going to come out in a, Mike Tyson style, you know, attire um, and sort of embody what he does. Like nowadays, I like Javante Tank Davis, Mm -hmm. who's like a mini Mike Tyson. Um, And yeah, I mean, boxing is the one thing I related to related so much to my dad with, because growing up, I never had I had a dad, of course, a a wonderful dad, an amazing dad. But it doesn't mean I had a dad. Like when you watch TV and you see like the dad sitting down giving his son advice or whatever. My dad, because of how he was raised, he doesn't know how to love. Like he's he's never said I love you. Even if I say now on the phone, he'll hang up. Hmm. He doesn't say I love you. He's never had to talk with me. The only thing my father talks to me about is, is, is your money good? What's happening in business? Same questions every time. If my phone rings and it says Baba, I know it's because a bill or a ticket accidentally went to his house and he wants to tell me about it. But the one way I was able to relate to my dad ever since a freaking child was watching boxing. Hmm. Every Saturday night boxing, like on pay-per-view, me and my dad would watch together and it's the one way. So the fact that for my first fight, he was ringside and saw me break my nose, I live with that. I live with that. My dad was devastated and horrible. And, I, and I, 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 he's not coming to this fight. I'm not allowing him to. But I know he's going to be watching from home. And I know he's going to be proud. Okay, so I've been Uh-oh. serious. This Super whole, serious. But I hope I hope they took something from it. Yep. I really yeah. do. I, I, it was inspiring to me. Very okay. inspiring. Yeah. Um, but my question is, so what's for lunch and dinner like what are we eating <laughs> we're just talking are you, just are, talking you about are you getting hangry we're gonna, we're i'm gonna, not at all i can is. you want me to fast today i'll fast here's today. what i got for you but i just i'm excited because it's we're in ohio we're yeah. under the sun i get to eat a good meal with you guys i just want to know what what yeah. we could look forward to i have some heart and liver you want to go you want to go deep 
I'll tip you on He's like, no, I'll just fast. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna fast today. <laughs> no, we got we got good food, dude. We're gonna we're gonna eat grass fed beef and No, I have a bunch of beef and, and fillets. You're gonna eat just the same as a king ate. Yeah. Good. Um, I asked that question about food and I realized this whole time I'm talking about food, but I just did that to like lighten the mood because I felt like I was so serious this time. Why this so serious? podcast. I know. Yeah, I'm babe. passionate. I'm always passionate. That's one thing I am. I'm passionate. Yeah, you can't about argue with the about. passion. And I think it is. It's inspiring. Like you, you want to be a motivational speaker. Yes, sir. And I hear that through the mic. It's, it's, you're, you're preaching, man. Um, and, and now here I am, I lighten the mood and here I am reverting to this, um, Dude. no, um, when I was in rehab, uh, in, can we end it with this? Can I say something like on the series and right now we want. just do that? Okay. Yeah. In, in rehab, in the steps that I was following for sobriety, I was doing the 12 step program. Um, one of the main things is believed in a power greater than myself. Now, a lot of the guys in there, including myself, had an issue with that because it was like, what if I don't have a relationship with God? What if what if I'm not connected? And they made it to the point of they were like, listen, your higher power can be whatever you want it to be that fits in with your life. You just have to believe in something greater than yourself. So you're not doing it in the eye perspective or believing everything's coming from you and like your energy and everything's coming. And I still, I dabbled with that. So when I was in the basketball court at rehab and I suck at basketball, I got cut sixth grade, seventh grade and eighth grade. Ninth grade, I learned just don't try out. I was shooting the baskets every day and I was missing. Now, what did I and as well as all the other people there do? Because we all sucked at basketball when we missed, but there were people on us and we were mad. I don't know if you can curse here. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah. But I would cuss. Why was I mad? I've never shot a basket a day in my life. How do I expect it to go in? So what I did was I was like, oh, what if I start practicing? What if every day I come here and I put up shots and I give myself this? And what did I notice? My shots started getting better. And the more shots went in, then we're going out. And I noticed improvement. So one day I go back into my little dorm room and I'm showering and I feel electric. Now I remember this feeling of electricity that I had in the past when I let it take over me and it consumed me and I lost my sense of self. And I was like, you know, every time I shot the basket now, it was, I wasn't saying I suck, I'm gonna miss. I would say, I don't miss. I do miss, but I would tell myself I don't miss. And I would rewire that. So when I was showering that day and I felt electric, like, yeah, I'm the man, I don't miss and all this stuff, I had a moment and I was like, wait, this isn't coming from me. The reason I'm not missing, the reason I'm feeling this energy, the reason I'm feeling excitement is not coming from me. There's something greater than myself that's giving me this power, this mm -hmm. ability, this energy. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I truly felt humbled and I had felt humility and I got on my knees that day not knowing how to speak to God because I've always been just conditioned to pray how my parents raised me and everything but I got down on my knees in tears and I just looked up and I said I don't know who I'm talking to I don't know what I'm saying and if this doesn't feel real don't accept my prayers but I just talked for the first time ever mm. and I say that because Every single prayer that I said every day, I would end it by saying, I know that every single person on this earth has been given a gift and a talent that if they utilized can make the world a better place. And I know my gift is to help people spiritually, emotionally, through the power of my voice to help empower them. Now, please help me access that. And that's what I know that I have, what I'm here to do. And that's why I want to motivate people through my trials and tribulations. That's Love amazing. That. And I've gotten so much better at harnessing my feelings because just like the past, I could have cried so many times this podcast, <laughs> but I'm still doing it with a smile yeah. now. I feel like so. we've been with you a lot. And I feel like this time's a lot different because like every time we would be with you, you'd be like, well, what should I do here? I need to get back on my medication or I need to do this or mm -hmm. I need to do this. And it's just so different this time mm. you just seem real and like yourself and more self-sufficient yeah and not like, holding your hand mm -mm. yeah mm -mm. yeah I, you seem like you're in control thank you yeah thank and i've you. known i've known you so well and so long that i usually didn't call you uh at your lowest point i call you at your highest because mm -hmm. that's when you actually needed 
the most. Mm. And, I, and I knew that. Mm. Um, when you were at your highest, and I see you on social at your peak, that's when I'm like, I need to call Fusi. Because mm. I know where your head's at when you're in them high places. Yeah. You actually feel your worst. Yeah. It's wild. So thanks for sharing this, that, that story. My, my dad came on here a couple episodes ago and had a very similar story about dropping to his knees and praying to God. Mm. And uh, those moments changed his life forever. So amazing. I'm so proud of you. You are an inspiration to me. Am I one of a kind? Should I smile more? You are definitely one of a kind. <laughs> and uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. I hope you guys feel a little inspiration. Um, you can watch the full episode on YouTube, listen to it on Spotify and Apple. And yeah, any, anything else from you guys? Anything? No, man. Yeah, thanks for coming was... all the way out to Ohio. Thank yeah. you. We told you that you have an apartment to stay anytime here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. That was the best night of sleep ever. I wear this ring that tracks my sleep in LA. My sleeps have been like in the 50s. I woke up this morning, it was at 86, and it said, your sleep was substantially better now. <laughs> what <laughs> happened? Welcome to Ohio. You need like a week. <laughs> I slept yeah. good. All right, uh, you guys want to wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Love you all so much. Thanks for listening and watching. You're beautiful. You're one of a kind. Smile more.